UCLA Next starts now. I'm Merritt McCoy. I'm Scott McLewitz. And I'm Cheryl Umana. This is UCLA Next. In this show, we will bring you to the places and faces of UCLA you might not expect to see. UCLA isn't just a bunch of laid-back surfers and valley girls looking for a place to park. Really? Mm. It's Southern California, but with a contemporary urban mix of cultures and attitudes. It's competitive and ambitious students and faculty from all around the world. On the south side of campus, UCLA is a medical school and hospital that provides cutting-edge care. Ouch. Okay, Scott. Up by Sunset Boulevard, UCLA is a law school, business school, and film school. So if you want to run it, shoot it, or sue it, North Campus is the place to be. In between are philosophers, folklorists, and engineers. Brain surgeons, rocket scientists. Right. Mm -hmm. On UCLA Next, we'll meet students and faculty from all over campus and notable alumni. Let's not forget the hundreds of people who keep the lights on. That's right, Scott. That's right. UCLA is a city within a city, and it takes a lot of people to keep it running. Tonight, we'll take a look at the UCLA Extension Program, where anyone in the community can take classes from cooking to computers. We'll have a sports and fitness segment on every show. That's right. Tonight, we get a lesson in crunches from UCLA basketball star Billy Knight. Each week, Dean Robert Rosen of the School of Theater, Film, and Television will take to dinner and a local restaurant and a movie where he and a guest will take a second look at an underappreciated film. Tonight, we'll go to Euro Chow in Westwood for a second look at Luis Valdez's film, Zoot Suit. And we will end each show with a visit to some obscure corner of UCLA with our campus explorers, Valerie and Alex. Tonight, they go to find out who fills all those vending machines. Word is, UCLA is pretty tough on vending machines. And why is that, Scott? I don't know. There are a lot of smart people here. They say if a vending mean... Vending machine. Uh-huh. Keep going. It, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. I think he's defeated, you Whoa. know? Well, have you ever defeated Whoa. a vending machine? Yes. Right. <laughs> I think we should take that look at UCLA Extension now. UCLA Extension is one of the nation's largest and most comprehensive continuing education providers for adults, and our students are working professionals for the most part. Um, many of them, most of them have uh, degrees, uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees, and they're looking for ways to advance themselves in their careers or to change careers uh, in addition to developing personally, intellectually, uh, creatively. Um, UCLA Extension actually predates UCLA here in Los Angeles. Um, we've been teaching classes uh, since as early as 1891, um, and we sort of became formally UCLA Extension in uh, 1917. Um, we have uh, 4,500 courses each year, 65,000 uh, individual students, uh, 100,000 enrollments every year, and. Um, you know, as I said, the vast majority are working professionals um, who are seeking career advancement or career change. Um, and um, here at 1010 Westwood, we're really excited because for the first time we have a building where we can consolidate all the, the visual arts, the, the arts and design courses that we have here at UCLA Extension. And, you know, again, um, we have an incredibly comprehensive uh, and well-regarded arts and design program. Uh, with 18,000 students in our arts and design programs alone. Um, and um, I'm going to meet with uh, Scott Hutchinson today, who's the director of visual arts, one of our programs, to talk a little bit about the work students are doing here. You know, 
think the mission of, uh, of a school like this, in, in part, is, is the community outreach and the open access. Um, and if, if part of your mission is getting the arts to the community and getting arts to be an accessible, understandable mm -hmm. medium, you, you, at some level, welcome the uh, attachment and the integration of other schools doing the same thing. Right. Um, the people that come back are pretty excited about what they do. Um, they really like it. And part of the teaching is an opportunity to kind of expose this to other people with highly diverse backgrounds. And I think you're on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is one of the computer labs for, uh, this is the visual arts computer lab. And uh, this again was a big uh, improvement for us. We had a, a, a former lab of 17 seat. Uh, this has 28 seats. Um, our audience, we were overfilling. We were having wait lists that we couldn't handle. Um, and so now we have this lab. And we also have other labs here on campus that we can uh, overflow into if we need to in this building. Uh, Entertainment Studies has a fantastic lab here. Uh, engineering has a lab. Um, we have institutional labs. Um, um, this one is mainly Mac-centric uh, because a lot of the stuff we do here in the graphic arts are on the Macintosh. But we do have the PCs also, and we use that for 3D, and we use that for some of the Maya classes and Lightwave classes. Um, but uh, uh, um, we're really happy about this space, and it's working out really well for us. I think the thing that's exciting for me uh, is to be able to help students take uh, knowledge that a lot of them maybe have gotten into day school and really apply it into uh, actually creating things that they can use in the real world and can you know, actually get employed doing it. It's not just theoretical. That's kind of the nice thing about extension, I think. Because this requires a plug-in, uh, people may have the wrong version. She's terrific. Uh, and she's, um, I mean, not only in terms of the content of the course, but any questions I have, she's able to answer them. If I ask her through email uh, specific questions, she sends the answers right back to me in the same day. So she's really very responsive. She's a terrific teacher. Of the plugin, and this is basically anathema to your Flash movie. It's going to you know, eliminate their ability to play it back. Um, but again, it, it kind of self-selects. Um, the people that really have a passion for it and want to be part of this and want to give back and want to learn and want to interact and engage and and have these kinds of challenges with these you know, super smart students, um, they're the ones that come. And uh, it, it actually works out quite well for, uh, for the student and for us and for the instructor. Uh, from my side, because I am production based, I kind of want to give them, a, aside from kind of a general overview of design, uh, kind of teaching them all the, the real life scenarios that can happen with all the programs that we're using. In work, um, you're not always lucky enough to have people that are going to actually like foster your knowledge. Um, sometimes coming in your more internship style. So this allows you to kind of gain the skills necessary to get you to the next level. So I'm going to move it sort of into position. We have an executive advisory board um, with some you know, very well-known designers and some of them are at, from Art Center, some are from Long Beach, some are from Northridge, um, the branded space, which for the arts is really important. This is not a hospital, it's, it's not sterile. Um, Rios and Associates, a guy named Mark Rios, the architect that did this, we, we think did a tremendous job mm -hmm. of retrofitting this building. Um, and it, it has the right appearance, has the right feel, has the right culture mm -hmm. for art and for exploration and space. This, I mean, this space here is, is ours. We can throw things on the wall. We can leave things. Uh, the process of this kind of you know, life casting or, uh, or mold making, or there's a jewelry class that we do here where people actually learn the, the craft of, of you know, making this stuff from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, I've been teaching photography at UCLA Extension for 16 years. You never know exactly what you're going to end up with, so you have to shoot a lot of things. Um, I love teaching because I know that I've had an impact on people's lives. I've been going to school for many, many, many years, uh, so I knew what I was getting myself into, even though my wife thinks I'm crazy. Why are you going back to school, taking more classes? But I love to learn uh, new things, and the extension program here, um, every class I've taken has been really worthwhile, so I keep coming back. I didn't know extension had been around <laughs> almost 100 years. So uh, what was that blue Cyclops thing on the, uh, the screen there, spinning around? What are you talking about? The, uh, the Cyclops thing, the one with the one eye, that one eye spinning. Yeah, I know what a cyclops is. Thank you. Yeah, you didn't see the blue cyclops no. that was dancing mm -mm. on the screen? Mm -mm. No. Well, they worked that no. out. Let's get tonight's fitness tip from eye. UCLA basketball star Billy Knight. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Billy Knight, number three on this year's UCLA men's basketball team. I'm going to teach you how to do the proper sit-ups so you can have a healthy, fit body. And as a basketball player, so you can jump higher and get in a proper defensive stance. All right, this is how you do a proper sit-up. Get down the ground, hands slightly above your knees, and you move up and back, up and back, about 30 times. And this is the only motion you need to do. And this relieves the pressure off your back. A lot of people mistake sit-ups as going all the way on the ground and coming up. This is very dangerous because it will ruin your back. Doing these proper ab sit-ups will get you the six-pack you need. He's so cute. Uh -huh. What did he have written on his shorts? I didn't play hard. Really? <sighs> on the court, during the game. Calm down. You think so? Yeah. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. Dirty, dirty. I'm not going to win this one. So let's tag along with Robert Rosen and film school instructor Daniel Bernardi on a visit to Eurochow Westwood for dinner and a second look at Louis Valdez's 1981 film Zoot Suit. I'm Bob Rosen, Dean of the School of Theater, Film, and Television, and I'd like to welcome you to a second look at the movies. You know those films you saw way back when that stick in your memory? Or maybe that film that you never did see but you wanted to? Well, now is the right moment to take a second look. And what better place to talk about the movies than around a table? And what better table than here at Eurochow in Westwood, right beside the UCLA campus in this absolutely spectacular architectural setting where their chef is preparing a sumptuous meal that crosses all national boundaries. And what better person to have it with than Professor Daniel Bernardi. The film we're going to take a look at this week is Zoot Suit. Zoot Suit was originally produced here in Los Angeles as a theater piece at the Aquarius Theater. It moved on to Broadway for a successful run and then in the early 80s was turned into a very important independently made the, uh, feature film. It was an opportunity for Luis Valdez to write and direct a piece that really exemplified his role as a leading figure in the Chicano theater and film movement. It provided starring roles for Daniel Valdez and playing his alter ego, Edward James Olmos was absolutely spectacular on Broadway. He, he actually got a Tony nomination. The story is the one of a trumped up murder trial of a group of young Chicanos set against the backdrop of the 1940 Zoot Suit riots. The film was viewed as distinctive for its adaptation from theater onto film. It was distinctive for incorporating into a serious dramatic piece, effective use of very provocative and evocative music, and most of all it was a milestone in the history of the depiction of Chicano life issues of, of social justice for Chicanos on film. We're in luck in that we have with us today Dr. Daniel Bernardi, who is a specialist on the relationship of the depiction of ethnicity and race on film. He's the author of numerous books, including the most recent one, Classic Hollywood, Classic Whiteness, that talks about uh, the issues of ethnicity on, on, on film. He's a professor at the University of Arizona, but we claim him as our own, as having gotten a PhD in the Department of Film and Television, and is now a visiting professor. Daniel, let me ask you about Zoot Suit. There's a holy grail that filmmakers follow of wanting to do serious social commentary, and at the same time films that are enjoyable, accessible, and where people walk out having feel, 
feeling that they've been entertained. You think Zoot Suit did it? Oh, the beauty of this film is that it entertains, it intrigues, it provokes you to question, and also indicts just that notion that there is a holy grail. For a film like this to really achieve success, it's got to get you to think, it's got to get you to enjoy the experience, and it also has to get you to think and question what is film. Yeah, but if you use a term like indict, it doesn't seem like a great, enjoyable experience for a spectator. Why should we go see it in terms of a night at the movies? Courtroom dramas are always dramatic, uh, ripe with conflict, and this one is no different. Yes, you can think and enjoy yourself at the same time. What about that mixture of music and serious drama? Did it work? Well, that's the beauty of this film. I mean, uh, in some ways, the music gets you to uh, to the point of escape, to the point of enjoying the mise-en-scene or the composition, the bright colors, the zoot suit costuming, but always it brings you back toward the plot. And the plot is an indictment of history, an indictment of Hollywood for the way in which it represents Latinos and Chicanos, and ultimately an indictment of the audience who fails to think and question and enjoy at the same time. This film asks you to enjoy yourself, to think and to be critical of the way in which film perpetuates stereotypes of Latinos. It's brilliant. If this was a breakthrough film, what's the history since? Has the lesson been learned from this movie by, by Hollywood, by filmmakers, about the depiction of Chicanos, Latinos, of, 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 of generally speaking racial identity on film? In the uh, independent arena, absolutely. Yes, this is a successful film. This film uh, has had a significant impact on Chicano cinema. In terms of mainstream Hollywood, Hollywood has yet to learn the lessons of stereotyping Latinos. It's struggling to bring in that market today, but it is doing so with the same old stereotypes that we saw at the time in which Zoot Suit was made, all the way back to early cinema and D.W. Griffith, who made films like The Greaser's Gauntlet. So, is the film a success? Absolutely. It's a success in terms of getting spectators to think critically who watch it. It's a success in terms of moving the Chicano film movement and culture into imaginative and uh, insightful directions. This was a movie made in the early 1980s. Would somebody here, in, you know, in this year, want to look at that film and, and get something out of it? Of course. It's a historical period piece. So what you're going to see when you sit down to Zoot Suit is a musical in some ways, is a drama, is an historical piece, but that... Um, that is a piece that asks you really to question representation itself. That asks you to question your, rep your relationship to representation, to get you to think about how your blind acceptance of entertainment is part of the problem. And all the while, you're gonna laugh, you're gonna cry, you're gonna cheer, and you're gonna be wowed by the aesthetics. As an academic who's really devoted himself to studying the issues of race and ethnicity, and I know the important work you did about the depiction of ethnicity in the t television series Star Trek. Uh, what's your goal? What's your mission? Well, I that's a great question. I want people to understand that media um, perpetuates stereotypes, perpetuates ideology under the banner of it's just entertainment. Media, Hollywood asks you not to think critically, to accept media as just escapism, and that's its power. Because if you escape, you fail to question. If you fail to question, the negative representations, the stereotypes continue and continue. So my goal as a scholar is to get people to think critically while they are enjoying the film. Well, I think Zoot Suit is clearly a film worth a second look. You've given us a lot of reasons for it, thinking critically and enjoying it at the same time. Thank you very much, and let's eat. Obviously, another important movie I've never seen. Maybe I should rent it. That's the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every week, we will end the show with a look at some forgotten corner of campus with Valerie Morrell and Alex Weeks. Let's meet them. Are we on? <laughs> Hi, I'm Valerie Morrell. And I'm Alex Weed. And we are? A dynamic duo of sorts, a dangerous detective working sort of people. 
of UCLA next. Yes. We're going to be uncovering the underbelly of UCLA for right. our viewers. You. For you, the viewers. Right. Well, I mean, I wouldn't exactly call it uh, uncovering an underbelly because that really doesn't make sense. I mean, if something was buried underground, we'd be uncovering it. But an underbelly is kind of like this little rodent, right? It's running and it has the... So, we're off to discover UCLA. For, For you. you. <laughs> oh my gosh, we're a team. <laughs> Shall we? Yes. Watch this. Tonight, Alex and Valerie visit vending services and find out what it takes to keep us all supplied with candy bars. It's got to be a lot of candy bars. We're going to take a look at vending machines on campus. Living on this stuff is as much a part of being a student as is you know, overpriced books and you know, pulling all-nighters. And have you ever been to that store? And as much as we all talk about being healthy, there's a can of orange juice and like a tuna sandwich in there. The rest is candy and cookies and microwavable cheeseburgers. Rumor has it that UCLA vending machines are some of the busiest in the industry, and they usually work. Usually. And they're never, ever empty. Uh, never completely empty. So we're going to visit the guys who make sure that you can just walk right out of class and get your caffeine and sugar. I sure hope you're not going to keep up that attitude. Little, little kiss. Is what? This right here? Okay. What? It's in your contract. Right here. We're supposed to have chemistry, yeah. they said. Ha! Huh. That's, that's, uh, that's not chemistry, baby. That's physics. <laughs> I'm feeling some, I'm seeing some physics right here. Hi. We are at a secret location on campus with Bob Kate, the supervisor of vending services. Say hi, Bob. And here's Bob Kate. Say hi, Bob. <laughs> Well, it's not exactly a secret location now that you said it's on UCLA campus. Oh, okay, it's anywhere, right? But it definitely is the UCLA campus. Oh, don't. <laughs> okay, let's take a tour into the uh, warehouse. <laughs> Says Bob, he's actually a robot. <laughs> he's plugged in right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Here's our warehouse. Uh, we've been in this facility for three years. Uh, before then, we were still at Hedricorp in a different part of the uh, building. You know, we operate uh, around the clock. Uh, UCLA's been a self-serve self um, organization on campus for uh, 30 years, I should say self-operated. Uh, most colleges uh, outsource their vending, but UCLA does it in-house. And uh, we take our jobs very seriously. and. We feel confident that we're providing um, our, our customers with the best possible service that they could get anywhere in, from anyone in the vending industry. It's a bold statement. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what we're all about, customer service, and um, it, it, it's, it's what we, we're here for, and we take it very seriously, and I think it's what we feel makes us uh, a cut above when any other operator would do should they, you know, attempt to, you know, service this uh, campus. Oh, your lucky day. You had the vending yeah. machine man here. I was wondering, are you guys the ones who fill the, the condoms and the tampons in the bathroom? In some of the locations. Um, not all of them, but we do at a few locations when, when requested. It's a, it's a customer service, that, uh, it's a customer service and or goodwill gesture that we, you know, provide to the uh, campus. <laughs> like little kids in a candy, candy, candy land. So candy. Boxes of M and M's. I don't like M and M's, but if I did, oh. oh yeah. Well, uh, I don't want to, you know, get too morbid, but. Uh, read somewhere that mm. statistically three people die a mm. year by pulling a vending machine down on top of them. I've I read about that happening. Yeah. I read about that happening. I don't remember you know, when it happened or what the statistics are, but uh, it's been known to happen where uh, I think students some, somewhere were, not on this campus, yeah. but somewhere else were rocking the um, soda machine back and forth and it, it fell on top of them. They, they're quite heavy. The machine itself is heavy, but when they're filled to capacity with product, um, it's, it's that much heavier. 
Oh, you can do Well, that. thank you very much. I, I hope you enjoyed your tour of the uh, our vending facility. Thank you, uh, Bob. Thank you very much. It was, it, was, it, was, it was nice to meet someone from another part of campus. So, um, I don't know, as a parting gift, you want to, I don't know, you know, free samples, or is that, you know, above your jurisdiction? Alex. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, there it is. You've got it. There's a warehouse of our vending services. Thanks. See you, Mr. Costner. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't you feel bad about defeating vending machines? Yeah, Bob was such a nice guy. Yeah. I never said I defeated a vending machine. Okay, whatever. Next week, Alex and Valerie are going to take us underneath campus in search of the legendary toilet graveyard. Mm. What is a toilet graveyard? You'll have to come back next week to find out. Anyway, Robert Rosen will take us to La Bruchetta in Westwood for a second look at Gallipoli. What, wasn't that with Mel Gibson? Yeah. Uh, a young Mel Gibson. No, no, a very young Mel Gibson. Yeah, that's enough. Okay, he's jealous. We have to tell them about next week's show, like the trip to the Veterans Garden. Mm -hmm. We'll join that traditional campus craziness, the crosstown rivalry, and the build-up to the football game against USC. It got ugly this year. I heard they had to call in the hazmat team. Mm, sounds like a great time. So, yeah. come back next week for UCLA Next. What the hell are we doing here? No, 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 it's great. It's great. Go ahead. It only How's takes it look? three hours. Oop, sorry. Are you You're trying to comfortable? address me? Again. Oh. Touching. <laughs> you, you I'm got telling. Oh. I'm telling. I am. Hi. Yeah. You already said that. That's redundant. Okay. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Anyways, we're, what we're basically doing is wait, you already said it, and that didn't even make sense. We're going to uncover the underbelly. No, no, this doesn't make sense. They don't have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. So stupid of sometimes. Of No, no, not at all. Oh, it's all right. I like it when you touch no. my face. <laughs> Quit. Quit. <laughs> when are we on and when are we off? Or are, um, are we constantly on? We're, I'll, we're pretty much always on. Oh, okay. Like that. yeah. That'll be my... Well, like right now we're on? Yeah. Oh. Thank <laughs> you.